A new technology has been developed by Australian researchers screening newborn babies for multiple genetic conditions using a single test. Joining us live with more is Natasha Robinson, the health editor at the Australian newspaper. Natasha, good to see you. Thanks for your time. As we know, every new parent is always very anxious to have doctors give their newborn the all clear on the health front. Now, this newborn screening program, as I understand it, is promising to be able to pick up hundreds of conditions in just one test. That's helpful for families, but also, I guess, more broadly for the public health system. Yeah, that's right. It is um, the sort of advances that have been made in DNA sequencing or what's being um, dubbed next generation DNA sequencing that has allowed this um, particular development um, of this technology. It's one of a number of um, different um, tests that are, in, are currently in clinical trials around Australia. Um, this particular technology, it's known as Atlas. Um, it's a, a private company in conjunction with some um, university researchers uh, and Queensland's uh, public pathology arm that has uh, run a sort of proof of concept um, study, a, a feasibility study, and the results of that that study were published this week in a, in a scientific journal. So they've shown that it is feasible for this type of testing to be done, which essentially in quite a, you know, a quick and um, relatively uh, low cost test is able to screen for hundreds of conditions um, at the same time. Um, but that's because the, the advances in this DNA technology al allows the analysis of multiple strands of DNA or RNA all at the same time. Um, what they're, they, they're, they're not sort of, you know, just throwing the sort of gates open to test for everything, however. So they, they, they've uh, they've isolated about 164 conditions that they, they can test for, which we know if they're detected that we can treat. So that's a fundamental principle of any kind of screening. Um, which is that you don't screen for something that you can really provide no solution for if it is detected because it's pointless for a start, but it also causes, you know, a very high degree of anxiety um, unnecessarily. So, um, yeah, it does seem to be not not too far off, I would suggest. Probably I would say within the next um, five five years or so, we'd see, we'll see these types of um next generation DNA sequencing technologies come into the newborn um, genetic screening space. At the moment, all babies tend to get what's known as a heel prick test where um, a little bit of blood is taken. And at the moment, there's about 30 conditions that are screened for on the national screening program. Um, so some of them are genetically um, based conditions, um, but this would, would really expand the suite. And um, yeah, for many of these conditions, early intervention is, is really critical. So it would um, be a, a sort of major um, preventative health strategy if we, if we did expand newborn screening in this manner. Natasha, on another issue, private telehealth companies, I understand they're subject to some new rules from this week. What are the changes? Why are they significant? And how have the big players in that private telehealth market adjusted their sort of business model ahead of the changes? Yeah, so they're actually um, not coming in these changes until the end of the month. Um, so they're, they're actually adjusting and preparing uh, at the moment. So it's September 1 that they're due to come in. Um, so yeah, there's been a real proliferation of these private telehealth companies since COVID. Um, and there's a couple of uh, reasons that they've become very, very popular. Um, one is just because telehealth is now funded um, uh, by the government, although these particular services are not funded, they're, they're privately paid for by patients. But given the fact that they are funded as as um, that came about um, under COVID in GPs have just become normalised. So patients are very used to this type of um, consultation now, so much more willing to, to pay for it. And also they're sort of priced um, at, at, a, at, a, at a point uh, because out-of-pocket costs tend to be so high now for so many people seeing a GP. It sometimes is actually cheaper to pay fully privately out-of-pocket for one of these instant sort of services. Um, but the medical board has become quite concerned about some of the practice practices of um, these private telehealth companies. There's a, a, just a, a just a, a minority of them in their sites. Um, they're concerned around their particular advertising. Um, the advertising of medicinals um, is is banned um, by the TGA, but some of these companies have become 
um, quite bold in the way that they're they're advertising medicines and skirting very close to the line in terms of those um, TGA rules. Um, they're also concerned that many patients who see or consult one of these services don't have any interaction whatsoever with the doctor. So they're having, um, you know, online consultations, sometimes not even in real time. Sometimes it's a quiz, which, you know, a patient will sort of fill out a questionnaire and that will go back to the doctor and then they'll be emailed saying, you know, um, th this is what re re uh, medication we, we suggest for you. Now the medical board is putting a stop to that. So this will very substantially threaten the business model of some of these operators, in particular those that are focusing on the weight loss medications. And um, some of those um, or a couple of those those players um, in particular, one of them, um, Juniper, which primar primarily used to prescribe for its patients as part of its weight loss service a, a medication called Sexenda, um, they have now switched to prescribing a Zempic, which they couldn't get access to before, which they they now can. So about six weeks um, ago, uh, Juniper started to email out um, all of its patients um, information that, you know, exciting news, we have a, a Zempic available now, of course, because Zempic is, you know, wildly popular um, as, a, as a weight loss drug, but it's also a crucial drug for diabetics and has been in short supply. And it, 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 there was another sort of like, you know, point of tension with the TGA when this happened, because at the same time that Juniper emailed out saying, you know, we've got this drug available, you know, come and get it, essentially. Um, the TGA had put out a statement saying, you know, it still recommended that this drug be prioritised for diabetics. So, you know, and I, I it did seem to be part of a, a business strategy, um, you know, coming up to these medical board changes, which will mean that mm. Juniper, which was doing this, um, asynchronous text prescribing what I described, um, you know, prescribing without yeah. an actual live consultation with a doctor, they're going to have to change their business model quite substantially. So they're, 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 they're you know, they're, they're, they're um, in this the Zempic, you know, they've opened up an enormous market for themselves um, with, with prescribing a Zempic and um, does seem mm -hmm. to be perhaps a sort of preemptive mood, move to shore up um, you know, their business ahead of uh, the, the looming threat. Um, so very interesting um, sorts of developments happening in the in the online telehealth world and especially the weight loss space. Um, I just do, you know, very much hope that, um, you know, um, all of these um, all these changes aren't, aren't, aren't making it increasingly difficult or ongoing, difficult in an ongoing uh, you know, way for for diabetics to actually access that that crucial medication. Mm -hmm. Gosh, we have to watch how all that plays out after the changes come in. Natasha, really appreciate your time as always. Thank you. Good to see you, Ash.